Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Software Architecture in New York City. I'm here with Victor from Lightbend. Victor, how are you doing? I'm good. You're good. I'm really so good. you're good. What what's good? What are you up to? So I've been focusing lately over the past couple of years trying to find good ways of connecting software together, um, both internally and externally. Uh, trying to find good programming models, find, trying to find good um, compromises between stuff like performance, scalability, uh, resilience. Um, when you say connecting things together, what, what, what does that mean? Are you, are you assembling language parts, <sighs> libraries, tools, frameworks, platforms? Every, everything. I think I think it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a ladder, um, and we connect things at multiple levels. And the question is, do we need different tools or different ways of thinking about connecting things together, depending on at which point it is? Is it externally or is it internally within a program? Does that fundamentally matter? Uh, which concerns do we have across these um, when we cross machines or when we cross networks? Um, philosophically, even a single machine is a distributed system because everything is not in one single place. Um, so trying to find good tooling, good programming APIs, uh, try to tackle the, the challenges. Uh. So when you say every machine is a distributed system, distributed systems today are kind of like the dial tone, aren't they? I mean, every, everything that most every company does is distributed. Yeah, and perhaps and, and perhaps we've come to realize that and trying to embrace that fact instead of trying to create this illusion of... Uh, it's like er oxygen now, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. It's, yeah. uh, and I think even, even decades ago, creating programs, even if it was just between the operator of the machine and the machine itself, it was still a distributed system between that operator and that computer. So I think um, we just see, see it at a different scale today. So as you're assembling all these pieces and components and stuff together, do you document that so that an another person can understand what you've done and then use it for their? So I do a lot of prototyping. So this is really technical, I think. Uh, I, I don't believe in, in just creating uh, ideas or, 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 or just thinking about stuff. I think, especially if if one wants to help others, one needs to focus on the tooling, and and the only way of doing that is to actually create tooling. <laughs> so, so trying to experiment with programming APIs. Um, I mean, technically, if if you anything beyond what's just Turing complete is user experience because it is. If all we needed was just something which was Turing complete, then that wouldn't be a, a very good user experience, and it wouldn't lead to maintainable systems. And it's not only about creating a solution, because the real work starts after you deploy it. All the evolutions, integrations over time, changing some elasticity and flexibility. Yeah, and yeah. trying to—I mean, the the entire thing behind software architecture is trying to figure out where the system needs to go. Right, it's not about designing for today. It's trying to design for how do we make it flexible where it needs to be flexible. How do we, where do how do we create scalability where it needs to be scalable and or resiliency yeah, and built in exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. So do you do you buy the notion that systems can be self healing? Absolutely. And sh and and are we getting closer to that happening? I would think we we are. Uh, absolutely. I mean. The entire there's been a shift both in in software l delivery, uh, making it uh, focusing on on being able to ship improvements uh, rapidly. But there's also been improvements in deploying things rapidly as well. And I think at some point, um, so Erlang has been doing it for a long time, being able to sort of hot upgrade a, an application in place. Um, the actor model, the even if the, even if the core of it doesn't have the resilience built in, there is the what we call a mandatory extension, which is supervision, uh, which is essentially being able to um, divide work and being able to observe if it fails. And if it fails, we need to have a strategy for dealing with failure. So it ma makes failures natural, uh, and the thing that you need is a, a way of dealing with it and not not sort of 
forgetting to deal with it or uh, conveniently forgetting to so deal it with it. So it doesn't fester and then become catastrophic or something? Yeah, or, or just uh, creates issues. Um, some systems, they, they have a, a low rate of failure, but if you increase the load, then you're also increasing the, the, the frequency of the failure. So something which might be fine with 100 users might not be fine at all with 1,000 or 10,000. So um, I, I, I really believe in, in, in thinking about uh, resilience and dealing with failures up front. It's, it's not really optional. So how important is actor-based or actor-oriented programming today? Is it growing? Is it... I, yeah, I, w I, w I would say that it is growing, absolutely. Um, I think there's uh, many languages have both uh, experimented with and many are looking to adopt uh, actor style, both libraries and frameworks and even in the standard library. Um, Erlang has had it for a very long time. Aka was created um, about 10 years ago. Uh, and there, I think I think the uh, the model is really appealing because it's a simple model. Are there domains that are more ripe for actor oriented? Uh, that's a tricky question. What do you mean by domain? Like a business domain, or yeah, a, like uh, or like is aerospace, or you know something that's more real time components to it, or something that's like a financial trading system, or is it something that has more low requirements that are more flexible and easy? I, th I think anything that deals with concurrency, having concurrent users or doing concurrent I.O. or I think virtually every single application or use case has those requirements. So I don't see a specific thing. Domain, good. No, it's... Uh, it's crossed everything then. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it is a universal model of computation, so technically you could use it for, for anything. But of course, with tooling, it's always do you choose something specific for a specific use case? Uh, do you adapt something to that specific use case? Or do you invent something for that use case? It's always a trade-off, uh, which I think is interesting for a software architecture uh, conference to, to sort of think about. We, there's, there's no single solution that will fit every use case. There's no, there's no optimal general solution. So. Uh, trying to find th those good trade-offs is, uh, is software architecture. Right? So speaking of a general solution, so what do you think, with all the software architects that are here this week, what should keep them all up at night the most? What is it that they are tackling on a day-to-day -day mm. basis that, that they should grapple with every day and, and, and struggle with? I mean, what, what is it that's hard right now with that, that job? Mm. That's a great question. I'm not sure that there is any sort of one solution. Yeah, one, answer. one answer to it. Uh, I, th I think my personal opinion is you always need to s sort of figure out what's necessary f for that specific domain or that specific uh, industry or, mm -hmm. or business. Um, and every every organization or every business has its sort of unique uh, setup or unique requirements or unique uh, composition of existing um, software and uh, and different functions in the business. So it, the, I d I'm, I'm not sure. Failure without learning from it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I really believe in, 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 in doing and adapting and trying to find uh, the right trade-offs. But I think going back to what I said before, I think it's software architecture is really about making the right trade-offs. Um, and that is the challenge that I think. And we are those trade-offs still among the four? I, I always look at four variables: time, cost, quality, and scope. And are those four variables <laughs> still at play in building software? I think they are, but it's because you never want to sacrifice quality, right? Well, so the thing is that it it's a very it depends on how you define quality. You don't want to you don't want to build something which takes too long to seize the opportunity because you Someone want it to be perfect. Yeah, right. right. First <laughs> fabulous or something else. Well, well, well so so yeah. I think it's really about finding the rate trade-offs for that specific thing, and sometimes it's about uh, um, paying more up front in order to get it mm -hmm. out fast. Uh, sometimes it's actually trying to do uh, to do. A smaller scope first. Um, I believe really in, in trying stuff out it, 
it, prototype or prototype. Yep, make yep. sure you have users. Make sure that yep. you're solving the right problems. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you getting user feedback. On yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oftentimes you you find out that what you imagined that people wanted, wanted or needed or um, or you just tried to solve a, a symptom rather than their actual problem. Um, and if you can focus on solving the actual problem, then... then uh, so that sounds like going back to the real specification requirement stage, like really knowing what it is you're solving before you start. Well, the, it's a bit of a catch-22, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I really believe in... If, if, you do, if you're doing protocols or if you're doing trying to do a standard or something like that, you really want to have a specification. But you can only get to that specification by trying stuff out. Um, oftentimes you have five or ten or even more different permutations of trade-offs and you end up with a specification that's sort of... A hybrid or... Yeah, hybrid or... or, or, or Frankenstein or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I guess <laughs> you end up with something. But I think uh, specifying up front does never work. And just putting something together and not standardizing it doesn't really help you down the line because now you have this sort of canonical uh, specification, which is the implementation. And then it's hard to know whether something was intentional or whether it just turned out that way. So uh, especially... So I've, be, I've, I've been doing a bit of specification work um, and iterate, get, a fee get feedback. Um, you never know. Like If you specify something, you don't know whether it's going to uh, put some constraints on how you implement it. Is it possible to imp implement this in a performant way? Is it possible to extend this in a, in a sensible way? So you really need to, uh, I think you really need to iterate on a specification to end up with something that really matches what you what do you aim for? So Victor, last question for me. So we don't want to generalize what keeps all the architects up at night, <laughs> but what keeps you up at night? What What is it that you're trying to tackle that may be a big, hard nut to crack and, and you're trying to figure out how am I going to do this? Or what what is it that keeps you up? So what I've been trying to do the past decade is trying to eliminate the perception that there is a trade-off to be made between productivity and scalability. Um, I think th there's, there is no inherent, uh, inherent uh, compromise between the two. I think you can really get productivity and scalability. Um, so that's what keeps me up at night. Can we... Can the trade-off between... There isn't, you don't think you see there's a trade-off? Yeah, yeah. You shouldn't have to trade those off. Yeah, because yeah. it's always... When some some organization or some person creates something um, and, and makes a lot of uh, trade-offs just to get something out there and then they have to rewrite it when they're successful when they really should be sort of adding features or, or making the most of this successful thing and then they end up having to do this sort of the, the, the great rewrite. Could that be slowing down when they're going? From the beginning, or I, I so so yeah. So what I'm trying to do is to find the the programming models and the the APIs and the ways of thinking about things such that you get really good productivity from from day one, and you also get the scalability. So if this thing really becomes successful, then you can it can grow with the success. Uh, so that's that's been my personal uh, goal for the past decade. Well, we look forward to seeing how that turns out. Thank you. Thank you.